Imagine being an astronaut on the moon. You're exploring a crater maybe 20, 30 kilometers away from home base. You have a rover. You have one or two buddies which are off a few hundred meters in different directions exploring. You're grabbing samples off the surface. You're putting them in your bag. Maybe you're digging for some core samples. And then you look up at the night sky. You see the Earth. And out of nowhere, out of nowhere with no sound at all, a meteorite that's no longer than the diameter of a grain of rice comes down and hits you in the elbow of your spacesuit. And you don't feel anything, but you begin to hear alarms things start telling you immediately that you're losing pressure in your spacesuit. So your first reaction is to get your other hand to go over there and to cover up the hole, which works up to a certain degree, but no matter how hard you press onto that hole, you're actually still allowing air to escape. The most important thing on your mind is to get back to the rover, which is pressurized, and so you make your way in that direction. And it's difficult on the moon because it's only one-sixth the gravity of the Earth. So you begin to make your way back to your transportation, which is a pressurized volume to get in through the airlock. But it's difficult because the moon has a gravity of about one-sixth of Earth gravity, so you can't really run. Basically, what you have to do is kind of hop your way back, which is slow and laborious. And it makes you breathe very hard because it's difficult. Eventually, you get very, very close to your rover, and you can't quite get in because at that point you've lost enough pressure where you start to get tunnel vision and you start to go unconscious. And then you collapse on the lunar surface. Now on the radio, your fellow astronauts hear all of this that's happening. So your buddy, who's a couple hundred meters away, is making his way over to you, trying to resuscitate you. And when he gets there, he sees that it's just too late. You've lost your oxygen, you're unconscious, and you're deceased. So you're an astronaut who died on the moon. This is just one scenario. It might be improbable for this exact scenario to happen, but eventually an astronaut will die on the moon. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, if we took a body and buried it on the lunar surface, would the body decompose in the way that it does on Earth? What would happen if we buried a body on the moon? By the way, in the olden days, many hundreds of years ago, during the long ocean voyages, which took many months, if someone died on the vessel, they didn't allow their decomposing corpse in the cargo hold. They held a burial service and put them out to sea. So we'll have to do something similar on the moon. My main questions are, would a body decay if we buried it on the moon? And if it did decay, would it mirror what happens to a decaying body on the Earth? Or would the body effectively be preserved forever? So in order to do this, we need to really talk about what happens on the Earth and then compare it to the environment in the Moon. Now, first of all, we are actually made, of course, of cells, but by weight, all of us are about 60% water by volume. Just think about that. 60% of everything in your body is water. Your cells have membranes on the outside effectively filled up with water. And so every cell in your body has water and a lot of other things on the inside. Now I'm going to warn you, we're going to talk about decomposition here, so if that bothers you, you might want to stop the video right now. Now, after humans die on the Earth, we slowly lose water. You know what happens to a glass of water without any fire, any boiling. The water eventually evaporates and disappears. A similar process happens in your body along with the decomposition. We're going to slowly become dehydrated on Earth in parallel with the decomposition. We're going to be losing water out through every pore of our body. So what follows here is a quick timeline of decomposition as it happens on the Earth, and then we'll be able to compare it to what might happen on the Moon. Keep in mind that everything is affected by temperature and by water content, pH of the soil if you're buried in the ground, and so on. In general, when things are hot, warm temperatures drive everything to happen faster, cold temperatures slow everything down. Also, more water content, moist environment allow things to speed up, and very dry environments also slow things down. Now, immediately after death, 
is a process called alger mortis. This is similar to rigor mortis, the way it sounds, alger mortis. That's just when the body's temperature is regulated up at normal body temperature, it begins to fall down to the temperature of the environment. And shortly after that, again, within hours, something called rigor mortis sets in. Rigor mortis is basically when the muscles stiffen up and don't become pliable anymore. It's due to the ATP in the cells being completely depleted. ATP, remember, is adenosine triphosphate. It's the chemical we have in all of our cells that stores energy, and basically we can tap that energy source to move and to do things. But once all the cells begin to die, respiration stops, ATP is exhausted, and the muscles begin to stiffen up. That's called rigor mortis within a couple of hours after death. Now, after several hours, up to many days after death, something called autolysis sets in. That's when the enzymes inside of your own cells begin to break down the cell walls from the inside because the purpose that those enzymes originally had, they're not executing on that because the person is deceased. There's no more respiration or metabolism. So those enzymes begin breaking down structures from the inside. Now don't forget that we're full of bacteria inside our own body, especially in our intestinal tract. Those bacteria are part of our life cycle and they have purposes and uses for us. We need bacteria in our gut. But after death, when respiration stops, those bacteria begin to multiply. Water is, again, being released from the cells as the cell walls begin to break down. And so the bacteria begin to multiply and they begin to metabolize and break down the structures from the inside out. And in the process of doing that, they release a lot of gas, usually hydrogen sulfide, methane, and other gases. And so after a period of time, you start to see a lot of bloating in the human body from the gases that are produced on the inside from the bacteria. I know it's kind of creepy, but around this time your skin begins to flake off and sort of disintegrate, and also your eyes begin to get cloudy and glazed over because the corneas are drying out. Now after weeks happen, up to many months, the internal organs again continue to break down, and that process mostly reaches its conclusion. Now around this time, the skin begins to take on sort of a waxy-like appearance, and also it appears that the nails, the fingernails, toenails, and also the hair, it appears as, it, as if it continues to grow, but actually as an aside, it's a common myth that fingernails and hair continue to grow after death. That doesn't happen. What's really going on is the the skin just surrounding the fingernail begins to shrink. Remember, we're losing water, things are becoming decomposed, and it's sort of retracting back. So it makes the nails appear as if they have grown longer, when actually it's just the skin shriveling up. Same thing is happening to the scalp. Scalp is shriveling up, hair appears to grow longer. The hair and the nails do not continue to grow after death. Now during this whole time, I haven't mentioned anything about insect activity, which are also continuing to break down structures. It's a little gross, so I skipped over it. But also that process is wrapping itself up after a few months into several years. By that time, all of the organs are gone. What mostly remains is the skeletal remains, and the skeleton can become calcified and harden up. It also becomes a little more brittle over time, but it can mostly retain the shape of the skeletal remains of human for many hundreds of years and even many millennia. You know, we can see bones from people that we can dig up that we know are many thousands of years old, and we can still see the bones there. Of course, the whole process can be slowed down. This entire process of decomposition can be slowed down, as the Egyptians teach us and other cultures, by mummifying people right after they die. And the process of mummification is basically trying to remove as many internal organs as possible to lower the count of the bacteria, to dry everything out, get rid of the water, so that the internal bacterial decomposition slows down. Now, I haven't mentioned much about the type of bacteria. There's two main kinds of bacteria that break down bodies. One is called aerobic bacteria, which requires oxygen to metabolize and break it down. And the other kind is called anaerobic bacteria, which do not require any oxygen. The reason I bring it up is because on the moon, we don't have any oxygen. So even though we have anaerobic and aerobic bacteria breaking down the internal structures, both kinds of bacteria require water. So if we don't have any water, then those bacteria can't do anything. And of course, we know there's very little water on the moon we'll talk about in just a minute. So now let's turn our attention to the moon. What is it actually like on the surface of the moon? 
Well, first of all, the main thing you're going to notice right away is that there are no clouds on the moon, and that is because there's no atmosphere on the moon. Now, actually, that's a little bit of a lie. There is a very tenuous layer, you know, this very tenuous layer of, of, of gas atoms above the lunar surface, but it is so tenuous as to almost be a perfect vacuum. So obviously you can't breathe anything on the surface of the moon. There's no oxygen, there's no water in the atmosphere, no nitrogen, very, very little trace amounts. Now, other than that, what you'll mostly notice on the moon is that you're at one sixth gravity. So to get around, as we mentioned before, you pretty much have to hop. If you try to run, it's very cumbersome for humans to do, especially in a bulky spacesuit. Now we kind of take it for granted because we have this amazing atmosphere on the surface of the earth, but that does actually two things for us. The first thing the atmosphere does is it protects us against the radiation coming from the sun. The sun sends out visible light, but also infrared, ultraviolet, and also other much more harmful frequencies like x-rays and other very high energy photons coming from the sun. But we have an atmosphere which can absorb and protect us from that. But on the moon, we don't have any of that. So if you are on the lunar surface, you have to deal with all of the radiation coming from the sun. Another big difference is there's an extreme swing in temperatures from day to night. The lunar day is about 14 days. That means over a 14 Earth day period, you will see the sun rise and go to the other horizon. But then it will be nighttime for 14, again, Earth days. So very, very long days and very, very long nights. And because we have no atmosphere on the moon and no bodies of water, nothing to help absorb the sunlight and kind of like keep everything warm during the nighttime phases, the temperature swings are crazy. During the lunar day, temperatures can soar up to about 127 degrees Celsius, which is about 260 degrees Fahrenheit. And then during the nighttime, it swings the other way to negative 173 degrees Celsius, which is about negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit. So basically, during the lunar day when the sun is in the sky, it's hotter than an oven, and at night when the sun is no longer in the sky, it is colder than any place you've ever been in your entire life. So you have very extreme temperature swings, hot to cold and back again, again on a 14-day cycle. Now there's no liquid water on the lunar surface, but recently we have discovered frozen water in the south pole of the moon. There are craters down there which never get any sunlight because they're permanently shadowed, and we can detect water in the what we call regolith of the moon. We don't say it's lunar dirt, we don't say the word dirt or sand, we call it lunar regolith. So we can detect water under the surface in the permanently shadowed regions of the moon. Now it's probably not a lake that you could skate on. It's probably just something that can be boiled out of the surface and then collected. But it's a big deal because if we built a base near the lunar south pole, then we may not have to take all of our water to the moon. We may not have to take all of our water from Earth. We might be able to just mine it out of the regolith on the moon. Now I've mentioned the lunar dust and regolith. It turns out when we landed on the moon before the first time, a lot of scientists thought the lunar lander might actually sink into the lunar surface, that it may not be hard rock at all. So that turned out to not be the case, but actually the lunar surface is covered in a very, very fine layer of dust. It's all called regolith, but the first top several centimeters is basically pulverized from meteor impacts over the millennia and over the billions of years. And so when you take this regolith and you look at it under a microscope, it's just as fine as talcum powder, a very, very fine powder. But when you look at it microscopically, it's very, very sharp. It's basically pulverized rock and it's very, very small. So astronauts have commented that this stuff is difficult to deal with because it sticks to everything due to static electricity and it's very abrasive. So in our example, we gave a meteorite coming in and hitting astronauts' elbow and springing a leak, but it might be something as simple as this regolith dust getting inside of a joint and you're moving around on the moon and your joints are, you have usually rubber gaskets at the joints, but if you get some of that very fine regolith in there, it could eat away at these joints and it could spring a leak just from the surface surface in the environment of the moon with the dust that's involved. Now another main difference between the moon and the earth is that the moon does not have a magnetic field. You might say, who cares? Well actually, if you watch Star Trek, you might see them say shields up and that protects them from something. Well, earth has a shield. It's called our magnetic field. And the sun is not only sending radiation out, photons out from the 
from the nuclear reactor, that's what we call the sun in the sky, but it's also sending what we call the solar wind. Very high energy protons and electrons and other ions are just streaming in all directions from the sun. And when they hit the earth, fortunately, above the atmosphere, they're hitting our magnetic field. And they get trapped in the magnetic field and they don't make it down to the surface because these high energy particles would actually damage or make it maybe even impossible for life to exist here. But our magnetic field protects us. On the surface of the moon, there is no magnetic field. So in addition to all the radiation hitting from the sun, the x-rays, everything else, then we have the solar wind constantly impacting the lunar surface. Lastly, there's no life on the moon. Not a single bacteria has been detected when we looked at all the moon rocks, digging down, looking for life on the moon. As far as we can tell, there's no life on the moon. So that's a main difference. Now, inside of our body, we carry a lot of bacteria with us. So if an astronaut actually died on the moon, we would have the bacteria part taking with us. So what would actually happen to an astronaut who died on the moon if we buried them or even if we just left them in a spacesuit? Well, the first thing that would happen that we know for sure would happen is the body would lose water very, very fast. Now, I don't think the body would like explode like you might see in the movies, but it would lose water rapidly. When you think about what boiling is anyway, we put a flame or a heat source underneath water and we give energy to the water and then the water can escape, but it's pushing against the atmosphere of the earth here. And that's what boiling is. It, pushes against the atmospheric pressure and can escape. If we go to the top of a mountain, we can still boil water, but it doesn't take as much heat to boil the water up there. Why? Well, because at the top of the mountain is less air pressure. It's easier for the water to escape and boil away, so you don't need as much of a flame to boil water on the top of a mountain. Now on the surface of the moon, it's almost a perfect vacuum. So you remove all of the external air pressure. And so two things are gonna happen. The water is gonna wanna boil because it's, it's still warm from your body temperature and there's no outside pressure at all. So it's gonna wanna boil away and rapidly evaporate due to that. And secondarily, since there's no outside pressure, but your body has internal pressure. I mean, I have pressure right now on the inside from all the air trapped in my cells and in every part of my body on the inside. There's gonna be a very high force pushing out. Again, I don't think you would actually explode, but what would happen is the water and all of the dissolved gases would very rapidly push and want to get out of the body. So the bottom line is, you would encounter a very rapid rate of dehydration on the surface of the moon compared to what we actually see on the Earth. If you picture one of those dehydrated fruit bars or a dehydrated banana, that's what I'm talking about. After the water escapes, all that is left, since we're 60% water, is the atoms and the molecules left behind inside of our cells, minus all of the water. So we're going to physically shrivel up a little bit more and uh, occupy a smaller volume with no water content or very little water content on the inside. Now remember, there's aerobic bacteria that need oxygen, but there's anaerobic bacteria that don't need any oxygen. So there's no oxygen on the moon, so that's okay. However, both kinds of bacteria require water to have any metabolism. So the bacteria that normally sets in with decomposition almost immediately after death, that process is going to be greatly slowed and then eventually stopped when all of the water exits the body. So the bottom line is we would rapidly probably start to look kind of like a mummy, a dehydrated, shriveled form of ourself, and other than that, begin to be preserved in our normal state. The decomposition won't set in, or it won't set in nearly as much as it does on the Earth, and we will effectively be preserved. Now, the interesting thing about it is, remember, there's a day-night cycle on the moon, very, very hot, then very, very cold, then very, very hot, then very, very cold. So this is just a guess on my part, but after we're very shriveled up and kind of hardened because there's no water, notice that your skin is flexible because of all the water inside. Once that's gone, you're not gonna be very flexible anymore. Then after a while with the day-night cycles, I think during the day your body will begin to expand. Remember when things get hot, they expand. And then when things get cold, they contract. So you'll expand and contract microscopically during the day-night cycle of the moon, and I think eventually over some long period of time, I think that eventually over some long period of time, it'll probably start to disintegrate or turn to dust because of the expansion and contraction. Although I can't prove it, I suspect that's what will probably happen. So the bottom line is we'll be dehydrated and eventually turn to dust on the moon. And even if that doesn't happen, a meteor or a meteorite will eventually come in from outer space and hit me exactly or hit nearby and turn me right back into dust to fall back on the lunar ground. 
So the circle of life will be completed on the moon, although a slightly different circle of life than what happens on the Earth. Now, I know this is a little bit morbid, but I hope you've enjoyed the discussion. If you're a fan of science and engineering, I hope you consider subscribing, and I'll see you in the next one. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.